Welcome back to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. It's been a while since we've done one of these. It's a former player interview, and today I am delighted to be joined by former Aberdeen midfielder Nicky Lowe. Nicky Lowe came through the Aberdeen Academy before being a successful part of our League Cup winning team in 2014. In the episode today, we talk about moving from Greenock and, and coming up to Aberdeen as a youngster and what it was like coming through the academy, limited first team opportunities and how he dealt with that as a youngster. And of course, we go in depth on that League Cup success. We then later on in the show chat about Nicky's departure of Aberdeen, dealing with injuries and what his thoughts are on the current campaign that he is part of at our growth. I hope you enjoy the episode and of course if you are watching on YouTube remember to hit that like button and leave us a comment down below with any thoughts that you have on the episode. Nikki, welcome to Red Tinted Glasses, it's a pleasure to get you on. Thanks for having me on, I appreciate it. Yeah, how are you doing in these strange times? Glad football's back now? Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted football's back. Obviously before I started I was at East Dillon in the Lone League so mm-hmm. I was suspended for a while and obviously Saturday's football day but I had a lot of Saturday with the missus and <laughs> stuff which was my usual Saturday and, and at least you can get out of the house and get a bit of freedom now and obviously you're at our growth now and going well so far this season which we'll, we'll come on to later on in the episode what I want to do at the start is kind of go back to you grew up in Greenock is that right? Yeah what, what was that like growing up there and your football upbringing uh, in Greenock? Where I'm from is a place called Gibbs Hill. It's obviously it's a kind of tough area. So I seen a lot of hangs and stuff when I was younger, <laughs> which kind of my mum was always delighted for me when I was going out a bit and playing football and had a chance to go to Aberdeen because most of my mates obviously went to jail and stuff or whatever. They're up the now. Yeah, that kind of saved me as well. So it was a blessing in disguise. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. You know, it's where I'm from and uh, I'm proud of it. And I'm glad I've managed to have a decent career from where I'm from, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's made you the person that you are, but what was that like when you were growing up in Greenock and, and how did that interest from Aberdeen initially come about? Were there other clubs scouting you at the time? Yeah, I was playing locally for my boys club. They were called East End United and uh, I used to be a striker back then and I was scoring mm-hmm. a lot of goals uh, and had a few teams interested. I was actually, when John Ward was a head scout at Aberdeen. Okay. The Glasgow based area, so that's how it came about. He went up to my granda after one of the games and said, "Would uh, it be alright if Nicky came to Aberdeen? Would you be happy for that?" And he was delighted. So I went up, had a look about the place at Hamilton Palace at the time we trained. Mm. I did the only games and stuff, and I signed. So I signed really young, but once I'd signed with Aberdeen stuff, I grew up a Celtic fan in Morton's mm. and Celtic wanted me as well. Uh, so it was one of the ones. Oh, what would I do? But. <laughs> looked after me and my granda said listen if you stay with Aberdeen and if you go and progress and make it full time you've got more chance of getting really good first team games there because mm-hmm. they'll take Rangers and stuff they can go and buy players whereas Aberdeen's not got as much money mm-hmm. so no frankly, I wouldn't change anything uh, come through Aberdeen I love my time there you know so that's how it came about Was was it a tough decision for you to to leave like home and because obviously you'd be going up yourself your, did your granda stay stay back in Greenwich? Yeah, my granddad knows that my mum and stuff stayed back. Uh, I love my mum and stuff, but my granddad always, he was the one that took me in my football. Mm. Uh, but when I was, I probably didn't kick in. I remember the elite, I was only about 15, about to turn 16 when I went full time at Aberdeen. And it didn't really sink in. I was actually moving away until maybe about two weeks before. And I had a wee, no party as such, but a few <laughs> around the house to say bye. And that's when I got a bit emotional and stuff. But it started when I went to Aberdeen. I was loved it, but I was really homesick and I nearly chucked it. Uh, and Peter Weir actually came in as head of youth in Glasgow based. And he's the one who got me full time and stuck by me because I had a few problems at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he helped me and I was I said, Listen, Peter, I'm just gonna wrap football and just go back home. And thankfully he spoke with me and my mum and stuff and I lasted it out and I felt I think I went and done quite well, you know, when I played. Yeah. And what what was that like? Did you live in Diggs when you moved up to Aberdeen? Yeah, I moved up to Diggs, up at Union Grove, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm called Irene Mayer, I think it's Lee Mayer's, is it Annie? I think okay. it was. Yeah. Uh, I still keep in contact with Irene and stuff, and her daughter Louise uh, lived there. I still mm-hmm. keep in contact, contact now, and uh, I go and see them and stuff, and on Aberdeen, they're such amazing people. So when I first went up, I moved, it was me and Michael Payton, uh, oh, Sheridan, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, boys as well. 
then obviously from when they on, I went, I stayed with Stephen O'Donnell, Callum McRobbie, Dean Jarvis, who was on the youth team at the time, mm-hmm. before moving into a flat with big Joe Shorten, say. No, I you two probably had some great nights in there, you and Joe. Loved a yeah. night out, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it, we could see on camera, but we'd have you. <laughs> <laughs> No, definitely. And uh, what was it like then, you know, coming through the academy and, and the coaching? Was it was it as hard as you expected coming to Aberdeen? No, to be honest, I thought coaching was hard and stuff, uh, but I thought it had been harder. Mm. Uh, stuff. But I, even when I grew up in the first team and stuff, it wasn't ever, only pre season was solid. Yeah. But when I always thought like the training and stuff would be really, really hard, uh, but it wasn't. It just kind of, it was tough enough, and you put, you got out of it what you put in, but mm-hmm. I thought it would be tougher, you know, but I think that's, that's not the way things are anymore. Yeah, and you said you were you signed as a striker by Aberdeen. So what caused you to move, or who like prompted your move into midfield? Well, I think I was still playing up front for Aberdeen at under seventeens. Uh, then I think it was Neil Cooper, uh, my youth team coach, mm-hmm. who was broke. Uh, he moved me because I wasn't like physically obviously very tall. He's like, there's a lot of long balls in Scottish football. He's like, it's mm-hmm. not going to because obviously I had technical ability. So he said. We'll move you left mid <clears throat> after a few months. I did well there, but he said, No, we you arrange your passing and stuff, we'll put you centre mid because mm-hmm. you've not space where you can get by someone. So mm-hmm. I'm happy with that. And he tried me centre mid. I think first couple of games I scored a few goals, did really well and never looked back. And it worked out for you pretty well. So was it was it Neil that made you captain of the nineteens and twenties then? Yeah, he made me captain. Uh, I think actual to be honest, Ryan Jack was getting going to be captain mm-hmm. but he's obviously run about the first team uh, quite a lot so he said we may as well make you a captain <laughs> uh, yeah well, a lot of people said it was kind of between you and Ryan Jack coming through at that time for that competition in the in the first team did you did you feel like that at the time probably not because Ryan at the time was always with the first team and I wasn't so mm. I didn't really see that as a case but once you get into the first team and you're in about it and you think your competition is Ryan, it was Willow Flood, Barry Robson and stuff, which for me, I, I felt should have, I was in, I was always in chat and uh, Derek's door saying, I feel I should be playing. Yeah. And he was another experienced pros ahead of you and you're doing well, so you need to be patient. That's why I think at the time, Aberdeen, we were doing really well and mm-hmm. the position were doing well, you know. I think maybe beforehand, before... Del came in and I was, I was a bit more experienced. I was still young under Craig Brown and stuff. Mm-hmm. But back then, we weren't a good side, in my opinion, back then. Yeah. I played well more and he always said you'd play more and it was really frustrating enough, you know. But obviously, when Derek came in and they signed Wallow and Barry and stuff, I knew it was going to be even harder to get a team. Yeah, I think that's it's something kind of when we spoke to Cammy Smith, he kind of shared the same sort of thing about under Craig Brown hoping that he was going to get more minutes but it never really came came to fruition during your time at the academy obviously you've mentioned there like Stephen O'Donnell um, who's who's now at Motherwell Michael Payton was there other guys that came through with you that, that never made it at Aberdeen? Yeah I try to think there's a few who like maybe not made at Aberdeen like, but Gully Soros and stuff who mm. have, they made like a handful of appearances maybe yeah. but they were really good players who were in different class attitude uh, the Faroese boys you'd mm-hmm. come in at 8 o'clock if you were early and stuff they were already in the gym <laughs> basically well better than everybody you know and mm-hmm. I thought especially with Gilly Sorensen's ability he's went and had a good career abroad now but mm-hmm. I thought if he was well bigger than everyone well stronger at the time I thought how could he not get a chance in the first team but I think his problem was it wasn't consistent enough in a youth team it'd be mm-hmm. brilliant one then he'd be missing for 4 or 5 so yeah, okay yeah from, you know, but there's lots of good players, obviously. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's plenty who you go on and do well and haven't. Mm-hmm. You, made, you made your first team debut in 2010 against Hearts. Do you remember much about that? Yes, I remember. I think I've told this story a few times, but <laughs> obviously, a sub, you've got the big jackets. And I was going to warm up, obviously, going by the Hearts dugout and find that there was a guy in that like, camouflage jacket, a big baldy guy, and he's shouting, uh, Get a jacket, fix you, you little midget. So when <laughs> I'm back, saying shut up, and he's trying to get down to me. So I was like, I was sprinting up to warm up just <laughs> back again. Oh yeah, obviously, then the game was three 0 when you're coming on. It's just mm-hmm. obviously you're buzzing. Uh, you make your debut. Yeah, and unfortunately, for one reason or another, you didn't 
get much more first team experience off of the back of that and you end up going on loan to, to Forfer. Um, was that a decision that you kind of pushed for going out and getting some first team action? Yeah, because I thought at that time I'd done everything in the youth team. I thought like I've been doing really well, performing every week for a few years now. Then I thought I'm ready to play first team at some sort of level. So it came about, obviously, Dick Campbell's mates with Craig Brown and Archie Knox. Mm-hmm. So I said, can I go on loan? And they said, listen, fourth row, take you. And I said, I was happy to go. And I went and I did really well there. Uh, so I think Craig Brown said, I want you back and stuff at the end of the season. I'm sure it was. Mm-hmm. Then he said, we are playing more. And then I think I made a couple of appearances off the bench. I mm-hmm. did well. And I was hit. And yeah. I was saying, that wasn't for me. I don't want to just sit about here and do this. I need to be playing. Because after getting a season at like first team, I want to keep playing first team. You don't want to go back sitting on a bench and stuff. Mm. So it wasn't letting me go on loan. And I think he let me go for a short period after that. Was it Aloha maybe? Yeah, it was Aloha, yeah. Because you are you said it was a successful period for you at Forfair. You won the Supporters Player of the Year and you, the Young Sky Blue Player of the Year as well. So not only were you obviously recognised by probably the players, but the fans obviously pretty much warranty as well and I think it's fair to say in your time at Aberdeen you're always a popular player amongst the support even though you didn't get as many minutes as you'd have maybe liked during your time yeah I think even now on Twitter and stuff I'll have them up visiting the city and stuff the mm-hmm. weekend away if fans come up and stuff and always talk highly of me but I think I'm one of the players who I think the fans know I give my all and stuff and mm-hmm. uh, all the games that I played for Aberdeen I don't think I ever had a bad game uh, I can remember but I always feel folk might be quick to tell you on Twitter after this goes out yeah exactly they'll they maybe say that in this game but uh, I always felt if I did well enough and I thought right maybe now I'll get a wee run of games to prove uh, myself and the team mm-hmm. but it never happened that way you know yeah and for you as a, as a player what was the biggest difference when Derek McInnes came into the into the side of like the team obviously managing from Craig Brown did you feel that you were going to get more of an opportunity and it just so happened that you touched on there that he brought an experience and that kind of pushed you down the, the pecking order with, with all due respect. Yeah, spot on. When he came in, actually, I remember I think somebody said, one of the coaching staff said, oh, you're going to be buzzing me, man, the guy that loves you. Because mm. I was saying how, but I remember I used to come watch, what is it, Johnston, and I was a captain of the youth team and we used to have Johnston all the time and it also would be, I always played well and I was <laughs> a captain back then. So I think it always kind of, I liked that. Mm-hmm. So then, listen, you'll be going nowhere. Uh, I don't give you a chance and stuff. But obviously, as you said, we signed a lot of good, good players. I thought, in my opinion, Barry, as I said, Barry Robson, Ryan Jack was there, Willow Flood, mm-hmm. Peter Paul, Emmy Smith stuff, higher up pitch. But so it was just frustrating. That I never got out on a game, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. But it was a season where you probably played your most for Aberdeen. That. Um, 13-14 season I've got you down as 12 league appearances and, and four in the, the league cup winning uh, campaign but that was also the season you scored your, your first goal for the club the free kick against Ross County in the 1-0 win that must have been a really good moment not only scoring your first goal but it being the winner as well Yeah I made it extra special obviously scoring your first uh, goal for Aberdeen as you come through academy is something you always want to do uh, being in a winning goal also made that a bit sweeter but it was what a feeling but I remember a big, I think I ran, was it to, I ran to Josh McGuinness maybe the bench because I think mm-hmm. he said before you're going to score the winner and it's, <laughs> he said come over to the bench and I did, you know, but it's just one of the things uh, I was buzzing with and the three points was obviously on that day was the most important thing. Had you been practising your free kicks in the week leading up? <sighs> that long I can't remember but I did, <laughs> you, I did used to try and practise free kicks and penalties and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously I took a lot of set plays so you obviously need to be decent at them. Oh, yeah, you've been off him. What was uh, what was Josh McGinnis like around the dressing room? <laughs> I'm sure he was one of the bigger characters. Yeah, he's a man. Everybody knows that. Uh, but he was a very good lad, to be honest. But very hyper, especially in the morning times. And you're just at your bed getting into training. And you're like a chill for half an hour, get a cup of tea or whatever. And he'd just been dancing about and stuff, singing. You're like, geez, oh, Josh, it's too early in the morning for this. <laughs> As I said, you were part of the, the League Cup winning campaign you played in all but one of the games during that campaign so I want to kind of go through that campaign with you and and see how you felt um it went really because that Alawa game was the first first game a very nervy night went to penalties and you took the second penalty that night 
did you volunteer to take a penalty or was it just you were asked by the manager? Uh, it was an every night, but I, I remember not many people think I said this, I don't think I've read since then. Uh, Derek said it'll be a horrible, horrible game. It'll be a tight game. Mm-hmm. The f- he's off. Uh, he called us. He's like, maybe go to penalties. Uh, and it did. He's like, but he did say, he's like, once we win this game and if we go and win the cup, nobody will talk about Arlo the first game. They'll forget about that. Mm-hmm. A big crowd in the final, which it worked out that way, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, yes, I volunteered, but I think they'll come up and say to me, listen, you'll be taking a penalty. And he's just going to ask me, don't what number I want to take because I think he knows I like taking penalties because it's a great mm. chance to score. Obviously, all the time you're going to miss a penalty, but no, it was a it was a rubbish game to be honest, and no one ever found bath. But I managed to get through it in the end. And and what was it about wanting to be second? Because um, you you took second in, in the final, which we'll we'll come up to. But is there a reason that you like going second in penalty shootouts? Well, I always think I'm a decent penalty taker, so I, I'm of opinion you should your your best penalty taker should be up in the first kind of three. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you can put pressure on your opponents mm-hmm. as your worst to the front, and then miss. You might your best might not get to take a chance towards the end, you know. So True. for me, I volunteer to uh, be one of the first ones. No, definitely. And then we got drawn away to Falkirk in the next round, and it was probably for me one of the most enjoyable games. Um, of that campaign was a 5-0 win and some of the football we played that night was unbelievable free-flowing passing football obviously Calvin picked up a book in early on and had to get taken off but Scotty Vernon picking up a hat-trick as well that night it just seemed to be almost the perfect performance in what was a potential tricky tr- tr- tricky tie yeah it's boring. they put I remember if I'm remember right they put the game on TV TV mm-hmm. Because Falkirk were flying at the time, and so when they put it on TV, that only means like a few weeks ago, obviously, Rafe beat Aberdeen. They think, oh, yeah. this is a good potential, would be a wee tricky upset here. So we knew that, but to be fair to Dell, he gave all young boys, I think a lot of young boys play that night mm-hmm. at the time. He, maybe Ryan Jack, Joe Shorten, say, Cammy Smith, I think, yeah. Peter Pop, uh, and we absolutely hammered him. Mm-hmm. Uh, enjoyable game for me in an Aberdeen shirt because I started. And yeah. looking back, I remember after the game, I was raging. Go walking into the gym and Derek McInnes is saying, What's up? I missed about four cells, and usually my finish is good and stuff. Uh, and I was raging, he's like, Shut up, just get in the changing room. Uh, I'd, played, I'd played really well, but obviously I had a chance to score a few goals, so I was gutted. Mm. But Big Sport came on and scored a hat trick and stuff, and it was a great team performance because folk were flying at the time, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, no, and that was, it set us on our way. Yeah, and, and that put, set us up with a, a quarter final again against Motherwell. You didn't play that night, were you? Were you out injured for that, or? Oh, I was just left out of the squad, and I was raging. Uh, <laughs> a guy there, uh, but I'd played a part. If I was got a games, I thought oh, I'll maybe be involved again. But listen, the main thing is not Nicky Lowe. It was about his team, and mm-hmm. thankfully, Big Joe didn't help getting sent off. No, and I we bought in Shea because uh, he was suspended for the semis. But mm. I think was it Big Andy that scored a great header for yeah. Johnny's piece. Uh, so thankfully, we won that. But I was raging about uh, being left out. But the main thing was getting into the semi final, which we did. And how much did you wind Joe up that night when he got sent off? <laughs> to be fair, you can tell it wasn't happy. I think it was gutted to think he knew that was him going to be out of the team for a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you don't really so want to keep your head up and stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. I just suppose like when, when stuff like that happens, it's more about rallying around him than, than taking the mick out of him to an extent. Oh, exactly. If it's close to ongoing stuff and you win, you can maybe say, what's that all about and stuff. But mm. that hell of his down, you know what I mean? But we just rather around him and they bounce back from it, you know? Yeah. And, and I obviously set up a semi final that was being played at a neutral venue, which was Tyne Castle. And for me, probably one of the best atmospheres I've witnessed at a domestic Aberdeen game in a long time, you know, the three stands at, at Tyne Castle. At, at 4 0 up, you get brought on in the 87th minute where you. Were you happy to, to get on the pitch at that point or were you, would you have been quite content just to sit and relax and watch the rest of the atmosphere? I was buzzing to get on because yeah, I remember the atmosphere that day was, time cast was amazing for atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So we were running a few goals up, it was rocking and it just one of the ones I kept warming up, looking at the bench saying, give me a shout, come on, get <laughs> me on. Well, do you know what I mean? Uh, but that, that day was amazing. Uh, it was a tight game to be fair at the start and I think mm-hmm. Jamie Lang made a world-class save. Uh, I think it was at 
two nil. Game's I think it was one nil. One nil, so that could change a game. But I uh, must feel when I sat on the bench that day, it was rocking. Yeah. Uh, so then, once we won that, I just all the boys were saying the final here's going to be madness. Uh, we'll bring a massive support, and it worked out that way. Uh, so how many? Uh, how busy was your phone at full time then for ticket requests? <laughs> So many people, people I didn't know support the Aberdeen were saying, oh, mm-hmm. my granddad lives in Aberdeen and I'm going to do game. But obviously you can only get so many tickets. Uh, I think I ended up got maybe 25, 30 tickets. Obviously you had to buy them and stuff, but mm. I managed to get a few. So I had a big support up that day supporting me. Yeah, so was that nice for you to get to the final office and get all your friends and family along to support you as well? Yeah, it made everything worthwhile. All your travelling is... Uh, the main thing for me is my granddad was there mm. uh, in Manchester scoring a penalty. That's everything he wanted to me lift a domestic trophy, score a goal in the SPL and stuff and make my debut and I done all that. Yeah. And uh, thankfully he was there to witness all that was a proud achievement for me, you know. But oh. my, yeah, my mum and I could hardly watch a penalty when I was taking it, you know, and they just heard about their hearing. So they were but, she wasn't the only one that could probably hardly watch the penalty shootout either. But do you think, like, for you, it was almost like a bit of a, a justification? I know hindsight's obviously like a wonderful thing, but when you had that advice as a young kid from, from your granddad saying, look, you'll get more opportunities at Aberdeen compared to, say, a Celtic, who obviously you were saying you, you supported, does that kind of vindicate that decision and, and the hard work obviously paying off that you've made your debut and you've gone on to win some silverware as well? Absolutely. I think I, he said that to me after the match. Uh, he's like, I told you, son, it'd be all worth it in the end. And mm-hmm. thank you. Because coming from Greenock to Aberdeen and stuff every Sunday was tough. Uh, we had to go to Glasgow and stuff, train three times a week. Obviously, it's still an hour up in our batch. There's a lot of mm-hmm. travel for it. And obviously, in the youth teams back then, we used to go to Germany, Ireland, tournaments and stuff. And my family wasn't obviously minted and stuff, and they were my granddad. So he kind of spent a lot of money on me travelling, which I she was appreciated so to give a little back and I gave my medal and stuff it meant the world to me no, that's class and you know you said you weren't in, you were raging at being left out of the squad in the quarter final how often were you chapping on the door to be involved in the squad for the final and you know Cammy was saying that you were in St Andrews before the final and you, you all got a call so when did you get your call that you'd be in the squad yeah I think when was it was it two nights before or the day before I think it maybe was it the day of the morning? I can't actually. In fact, I think it maybe I got mine the day of the game. I think it was late, but I remember me and Big Joe were sharing the room and we mm-hmm. both was uh, thinking, "Oh no, you don't want to be left out." And, uh, I'm sure Joe was left out that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was one of the ones I was buzzing, but my good mate wasn't. So it was one of the ones. But once the game started and stuff, I was just buzzing, going to on the bus, going to the stadium, and all the fans were there. Rocking the bus, it was an atmosphere I'll never forget. And and how did it feel when you then got the call to to come on the pitch? Uh, obviously nil nil at the time when you came on. Did you confident you could influence the game? Yeah, I thought it was a, another one. It was, wasn't a great game, and I must mm-hmm. think just have one moment of quality uh, and try and win a game. But I don't know if you remember, but I, I had a free kick and I, I put it over the bar. It was a rubbish free kick. Then I think it was Graham Shinney was bombing down. Uh, our left, hand, our right hand side, and I, I think was it me. I smashed them and gave away a kick not far from your goal. Mm-hmm. So if they score here, I'm going to be the most hated man in Aberdeen. Yeah. Uh, please miss, please miss, and thankfully they missed as well. You know, but just being in a game, I can't remember much of the final. To be honest, I think your adrenaline is just going that much. You just want to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, thankfully, we did that in the end, but it wasn't a game. Uh, for a neutral to watch anyway, that's for sure. No, it wasn't. And like, so it was a very nervy affair for probably those that supported both Aberdeen and, and Cali. And obviously, glad it went the right way. But you you stepped up uh, against Allo in the first game. Were you, you know, voiceless in your uh, wanting to step up and take a penalty in the final? Yeah, I wanted to take one. As I said previously, I fancy myself usually. So obviously, I put my hand up uh, to take a penalty. And thankfully, it went in. You know, because I think they missed the first one after Barry yeah. scored. Mm-hmm. But gave us a wee cushion, you know, so the boys can up. I can I can made it easy for the boys going next. <laughs> I was gonna say, does that make it easier or harder knowing that the person like Inverness had obviously gone and missed their first one? So like you said, you did have that little bit of cushion. Does that play in your mind as you're walking up to the, the penalty spot? Yeah, I think it does because you know they've missed so like 
right? If I score here, we've got a great chance now. Because mm-hmm. if you go in, then the boy, the next boy for Inverness, he's obviously thinking, I must score here over another goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to be fair, we had practiced penalties the week leading up to it, and uh, Gaffer had made us do it all right. Uh, line up at half line and stuff and walk up so I think it was and it was well I was nervous walking up and training I think myself yeah. was going on, but I think that was cover from uh, mm-hmm. getting the boys used to it you know what yeah. I mean because we done it I think every day that week and I scored every penalty I took so going into a game I was confident I would score and when you're when you're practicing in the lead up are you going the same side every time Mo- mostly every time yeah when I can uh, if I first got a penalty I went that side and I mm. scored, well and scored so I thought I would get a penalty in, that, in the final and stuff and I'm offered to her, that's where I'm going, you know. Yeah. But I went to the other side a few times just in case you're hitting better. Sometimes yeah. you're practising, you put it in a specific corner well, so on a Saturday you maybe write, right, I know where I'm going here. Mm-hmm. I obviously saw the outpouring of emotion from your celebration when the ball hit the back of the net. Was that relief that it did hit the back of the net or was that the realisation that we're, we're getting one step closer to lifting that trophy? No, I think it was, I, I thought, oh, we've got a right chance now I win this. I think that mm-hmm. was it. Uh, and I think it was Barry Robson shouting, get freaking back here. Uh, <laughs> boy, and my drilling was, I, he's experienced. So mm-hmm. it's just, he was known, it's not done yet. Get yourself back here and see what happens. And then when Adam steps up to take what was obviously the, the winning penalty, what was the what was the feeling like when he was stepping up? And then for you, when you saw that hit the back of the net? That was one of the best days of my life when he had it back in it. Just one of the things you're thinking. When he's going up, you're thinking, go. Mm. He's an he's a good penalty taker. He would miss the odd one, as everybody does. But you're thinking, when he's got a penalty, you fancy him to score. So I was confident then. Then when I hit the net, and everybody just, like, yeah, you see a picture of his face, just all different motions, and we just off we go to the corner. What yeah. a feeling. What a feeling and what a night out that um, followed afterwards for, for many an, a fan, but also many a player as well. Um, I hear the bus journey home was was uh, very enjoyable with karaoke and Barry Robson funding the, the booze run. Were you part of the, the youth players that were just throwing anything and everything into the trolley in that Tesco? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, as I remember, take as a gaffer had said, no getting need of drink spirits or something because we had to go back to see all the chairman, all the families mm. at the and uh, I think it was, I could be wrong, but I think it was a skip, Russell Anderson. <laughs> he was one of vodka and Jaeger bombs. <laughs> Then all the young boys are saying, like, throwing the trolley, Baz is play, paying for it, or, so the trolley was full, so it cost him a few quid that night, but I don't think it would change it, and obviously, as you said, everybody had a shot in karaoke, so no, it was an absolutely brilliant uh, bus on the back up the road. Yeah, and as we spoke about before before recording, you and Joe certainly enjoyed your night um, with the fans out, outside Seoul. Just, did that make you kind of realise what, like the sense of achievement you guys had created when you saw how much it meant to the fans that night in, in town celebrating yeah uh, I think you know a bigger club and stuff Aberdeen is anyway mm-hmm. but when you achieve something big like win the domestic trophy and you're out at night and you're seeing thousands and thousands of fans just sitting there that's what I said to Joe next day I said Joe we're in as police van going crazy and there's just thousands of Aberdeen fans singing ways and we're starting to start a ch- chance mm-hmm. uh, one of the ones I was like, and years to come, you look back and think, what a, what a couple of nights. Yeah. But it was uh, just what a feeling to bring a trophy home to Aberdeen after I was at 19, 20 years it was. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, far too long anyway. And then even the parade as well, you've seen the kind of iconic pictures now with that bus making its way through the, the crowds down Union Street. What was that like that day for you as a player on the, on the open top bus? It was surreal to be honest, because I remember you're leading up to it and you know you're having obviously the bus parade and people saying all oh, the a few thousand here and stuff and people saying all oh, the well we earn that and people saying mm. no way. then obviously once you get there and the Union Street's just full with Aberdeen supporters just this whole way down you see flags the red jerseys and stuff mm-hmm. oh, it was what a day again yeah no I mean I mean just what an experience that whole campaign was and still for me the first trophy I've seen Aberdeen lift and hopefully we, we get to see more and don't have to wait as many years 
um, as we did for, for that, that trophy. But it also led to um, European football and, and you managed to experience some of that at your time at Aberdeen playing against Dugava Riga. You came on away to, to Groningen and, and also you, you got 20 minutes against Real Sociedad, which you were, I don't know if you even managed to touch the ball that night. But, but what was that like for you getting to experience European football? It was brilliant. It's obviously something you always want to achieve when you're a young boy, you want to play the European thing. A lot better players than me won't get to even do that. So mm -hmm. they really uh, amazing and stuff, obviously. But you're know, playing against Real Sociedad, so you're usually watching against Barca and Real, you know. <laughs> a long night but it's over there. Obviously, I came on about the last 20 minutes, but I think I did went on the right I came on the right hand side. I did really well. I had a couple of chances at goal. Uh, I had a free kick. I thought it was a penalty at the time. I thought a boy jumped up and hurt his arm, mm -hmm. but looking back. But once I had it, I thought it was in as well because I caught it. Good. But the thing, I think we had, we had it out well, but I think the boy scored out of the box. I forget the boy's name, really fitted boy. He scored a screamer and it was a hard night on for then. Yeah, well, I mean, that was the only time I think Aberdeen have ever played on my birthday. And the only thing I really remember from that trip was just the Northern Lights rendition for the last 20 minutes. Um, that got that got sung in San Sebastian, but just even the experiences of of Groningen, and I suppose you know they wrote us off going over there, and we put in a brilliant performance to to win uh, two one, and yeah, just following that up against Sociedad, it's a tough opponent, but we didn't disgrace ourselves by any means or imagination. So I think it's really interesting to see how you as a player found that experience as well. Yeah, it was brilliant, especially was it the first game at uh, Petodre against Groningen was nothing mm -hmm. each. And mm -hmm. they directed us after the match and stuff and said they were 99% through in the next round and stuff. Did that get it's, talked about much in the changing room, that comment? It got pinned up. Did it? Their, yeah, I was pinned up in the changing room. And uh, I think that riled a few of us, to be honest, because that's really disrespectful. Even playing domestic and stuff, if you're playing against a League 2 team here and you're expected to beat them, you still don't go and say stuff like that because mm -hmm. that will come back to bite you. Uh, and it's just been disrespectful. So kind of, we were out there and we scored two goals in quick succession and after that we really seen the game out brilliantly, defending mm -hmm. brilliantly. It was happy to get it right up then for that. <laughs> no, definitely. Unfortunately, you know, things didn't work out for you at Aberdeen much more after after that season and your, your time came to an end. And you, you moved on to Dundee in search of, of first team football and um, before joining Derry over in Ireland. Were you disappointed in leaving Aberdeen in, in the first instance? And then also what made you choose going over to, to Ireland um, to play for Derry? Yeah, when I was leaving Aberdeen, I got offered another deal. But uh, I spoke to Derry and stuff and he said, listen, I'm going to be honest, because me and him, we still got on now, still keep in contact. He said, I'm going to be honest with you, it could be the same again, like, a few games here and there, most mm. of the squad basically. So nothing was going to change. And I just thought, you know what, I'm at age where I need to be playing, and I thought it's a great chance to go to Dundee and play. So I signed a three-year deal, and I was buzzing to get going. Then in pre-season against Ray Fovers, I picked up an injury, and we couldn't find the, I couldn't get a bump yet. We were getting scans and stuff, and nothing was coming up. And Hartley was saying to me, "Play with stakes in your foot, like where I felt the pressure was and okay. stuff." It was. He's like, "I've done it before," so I was getting. I played a few games. Okay, and I, and I got to stage I could hardly walk, couldn't kick the ball, mm. uh, and I ended up finding that I had a, a Achilles injury I had to get. And after that, I got the operation stuff, come back, then I kept breaking down with my groin and stuff. Mm. So everything went wrong, then the, it could, it did go wrong, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I fell out of the picture there because I was injured a lot and that happens at football. So I, I wanted to go on loan. I said to my agent, Who do we know? I want like, something different. I could have went to the championship and played there at the time, but I thought, no, nah, I need a change. Mm -hmm. He said, well, in a shield, he's at Derry, and he'll play attractive football where you want to play. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I said, listen, I think Nick is available for loan. He said, yes, get him over in the next flight. And that was us. And, and you seem to enjoy your time over there. Um, I think, did, did you still continue to have a bit of injury trouble over there? But the fans certainly bought into your style of play. Yeah, uh, I still had a wee bit of problem with my groin at the time for leaving Dundee. Uh, I had a few injections and stuff. Uh, but I managed to play quite a lot. Then the second season, I had a hernia. Uh, uh, so it was a, a bugger. But the games I played over there, I did really well and the fans took to me. And uh, I loved my time there. 
Uh, I only moved back home because I had a bus pipe in my house and it was snowing and <laughs> my, I was life in beams. My whole house collapsed, all my roofs and oh. stuff. So uh, that's how I'm, I came back home, you know. And and I suppose, the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's strange how these things end up working out. And it's a shame that that's, that's what caused you to move back home. But how would you have compared Irish football to, to Scottish Premiership football? Are they of similar level? I think at a time when I was there, when Doc, when Doc went through a transition, transition period here mm. just now. But when I was first over there, Doc, I would say the Shamrock Rovers, yeah, at that time, and maybe Cork uh, could play as well in a Premiership here. Mm. It's the like Championship standard. The second season too, I would say it's like Championship. Mm. Uh, that's what I would say. Yeah, some good clubs over there, but not many people know about Irish football. But some a lot of good players. Obviously, I played well in McInerney. We went to Shamrock Rovers, then he signed for Hearts there. Mm. So it's good players over there, but it's a good league. It's more. In Scottish football, it's a lot of long balls, a lot of second second balls, a lot mm-hmm. of fighting. Over in the League of Ireland, it's more passing the ball. It's a, it's a lot more football played, which suited me. Yeah, well, it's, it's good that it was uh, something that suited your game. Obviously, you, you moved back to back to Scotland. How did the the move to East Stirlingshire come about? Was that just your desire to? Because I was reading an article. Was did you kind of fall out of love with the game at one point? Yeah, uh, I nearly quit, obviously, a few times, but I well, I was hating it because I was always injured and stuff. I couldn't train. I was just basically playing games and that. And you don't feel good when you do that. Mm. Uh, and I was in so much pain. When my groin was at its worst, I would play a Saturday and I wouldn't go to bed till Monday. I was in that much pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, what am I doing with this? Uh, so I went, I was back, when I came back for Derry, obviously, at summer football, so my contract was up. Mm-hmm. And I, January here, so I was in training with Morton because obviously it's locally mm-hmm. uh, the manager, and he offered me. A co- I was in training and uh, I was doing really well when I got offered the contract, but the money was wasn't great, and I, I couldn't pay my bills if I'd signed mm-hmm. for that. I'd have loved to have signed, uh, so I said I'm sorry, I can't. And guys, next me phoned me who I played with Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. He was the manager. I said, "You fancy coming up? Have a wee look at us, and we'll have a look at you. See what kind of state I finish you in." And I went up, and after like the first day or two days, he offered me a contract. Uh, and thankfully, I signed that. It started really well. I think we'd won seven out of eight games. Mm-hmm. I was with Jay, Kai Jacobs, is it now Morton Caps, and we were doing really well. Then I got injured again. And in the games I'd played, everybody was sort of saying, Oh, how good am I? Queen is how fans were loving me. Mm-hmm. And then sat, my groin kicked in again, and I missed the next 12, 13 league games whatever it was and that was me so after that I said I, I, I'm going to retire I mm-hmm. had in my uh, I'm actually going back for the last couple of games but I should have never played because I wasn't fit I wasn't helping the team or myself so I said to him I said that's me I think my time's up and mm-hmm. yeah because I'm um, football daft I love football I'm good yeah. at nothing else but the football based stuff so yeah. uh, I was sitting in the house and I think Mark Muller who I know from here he was uh, well, I was at the time, I think he was going to East Stirling. He'd spoke to him saying, Oh, listen, I think Nicky Lowe's maybe thinking they're going part time or chucking it, I'm not sure. If he's wanting to mm-hmm. get my phone. So I thought, well, part time is maybe less uh, strain on my body. Mm-hmm. So, um, I said, they said, Come up, have a look, went up, signed and stuff. Thankfully, touch wood. Since then, the last couple of years, I've not had any injuries, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously, my body. So I don't know if my groin's better now or if I went full time again. I would it's be sore. I would be agony and now I'm not I feel fine uh, so I've got to know what can happen in the future but I'm really enjoying my football just now at Arbroath and I feel so I'm doing really well Yeah and, and I suppose during those times where it is really tough for you and you're going through the kind of injury hell if, if it's fair to call it that uh, how how crucial for you was that support network of your, your family and your friends in, in keeping you motivated? It's massive uh, I used to when I was injured a lot I used to come back and drink on Saturday and stuff through to Sundays and mm. my mates they need to stop it get going again but when that's all you know is football when you can't play or train it's I was so sad at the time I was depressed and stuff mm-hmm. and my wife Natalie she was amazing for me uh, kept me going and stuff because there was a lot of dark days uh, mm-hmm. you know what I mean but thankfully everything's all good now and I feel so I'm making up for lost cause the last few years of injury health 
Yeah, and and you know you certainly are. You said you know you're playing your football at our growth and our growth are, are are flying just now. We're we're recording this at the the start of the international break and our growth are going into. You only lost it to Inverness and um, the opening day of the season. But what was that like getting that call from Dick Campbell? You you touched on earlier in the episode. You you played under him at, at four for previously. Was that an easy decision for you to go and join our growth? Or obviously it's a bit of a long commute for for, for match days anyway. Yeah, it was. Once to be fair, when I was at East Island, and if it always stopped, so it was an easy uh, when it it phoned me. I didn't have his number saved. Obviously, I don't know numbers and then when uh, yeah, we I'm so and so yeah. Yeah. I need you to come and do me a favour for five or six weeks. And to be fair, at the start, he was honest. He's like, listen, nigga, you won't play. You've not played in months. You're not going to be match fit. Uh, you maybe not play at all. He's like, but I need you. You'd be good at changing him and stuff because he knows a character. Man. And the uh, first game we went up, it was actually in Vernes. Uh, I'd only signed on first day, so I didn't meet the boys. Mm. I managed to he put me on the last 10, 12 minutes, I think it was. I did reasonably okay in that game. Then I must have shown up well on the Monday, Wednesday training. Mm. Then I went to the starting team against Alloa. Saturday, I set up a goal, did really well. Then I played every minute after that, you know, so... It was a it was an easy call to make, especially when it's Dick Campbell calling. <laughs> yeah, you don't say no to him. And uh, have you been on the end of any bollocking so far this season? So far, uh, well, I must have penalty down the air, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm using decent penalties, but yeah. I got. I didn't. I tried to just put it in the top corner and hit the bar. <laughs> uh, so it was at me after the game for that. Uh, but thankfully, I'm playing well, so I've not really had any hair dryer treatment just now. Sure. But it's still still early in the season. And and you know, you know, maybe some people underestimate our growth and what they're they're capable of doing um, domestically. And I think you guys showed what the potential is there in the League Cup. You know, you ran St Johnston all the way. Uh, you took them to penalties. Did you feel you were unlucky that day? Certainly, we should have won a game. To be honest, we should have went through. Uh, mm. In my opinion, and a lot of others, uh, we should have definitely went through. And uh, their second goal came from, it should have been a foul on our right back. I think Big Sean only came up front in the last 10, 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And the defender got in front of him. And as he's got in front of him, Sean's pushed him. Mm-hmm. And he felt it broke for a corner and they scored from that. So we felt a bit hard done by. But as football, these things go for you and hang. But I think on the day, we did enough to go through. I think you could tell St. Johnson had played in Europe on the first mm-hmm. day, which obviously helped us. No qualms about it. Yeah. But we was disappointed uh, we couldn't see it through you know but credit to Johnson they managed to come back and win but obviously as you said uh, only defeat in the league is Inverness first game and we mm-hmm. should have never that game it was a mistake from a young boy in our team which happens mm-hmm. uh, but with a lot of ball we just couldn't uh, cut an edge to break Inverness down uh, so we're doing alright you know yeah and you know like I said to you I suppose the result that really kind of perked my ears in terms of the championship so far the season was that that win that you guys had over over Park Thistle, you scored your first goal for our growth in that game, and it was a three one win. And you know people were fancying Park Thistle maybe for for the league, um, and they'd started well, but you know that result it's not you know just that, oh you've just edged the one nil you know it was it was comprehensive, and then to follow that up again on Saturday with a three nil win over Dunfermline, who yes maybe have started the season poorly but they've spent big to strengthen their squad it's a bit of a doing I'll, I'll say that you know you, you might want to if you, if you agree but you know you've got uh, McKenna there in midfield you know he's fairly banging them in just now as well yeah I think Mikey's flying just now which helps when you've got someone on form him and Big Jonah will have uh, got a partnership is working really well just now in fact for us it's there's complaint of goals and setting up goals but as you said against Partick first half was we scored an own goal, we keep a saved it, it came back and hit a boy and went in the net. We're lucky again. But so first half we weren't great, to be mm-hmm. honest. We got a rollicking from the gaffer. We came out the traps flying second half and to be honest, as you said, it came in five or six on a day. Uh don't think Patrick would argue that. Uh, we got our first goal and then after that we just kind of battered them, you know. Obviously mm-hmm. Patrick it was gonna be a tough they're a, a top team with a top management staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, They'll have ambitions of going back up to the Premiership, to be honest. Uh, so we kicked on there. Then we obviously went to Dunfermline on Saturday, East End Park, and 
we put in a really good show and thankfully we went away with three points on another day it could have been more but they could have scored a few goals ourselves you know so mm-hmm. three points away at Dunfermline and a, a clean sheet it's not many people do that this season going there yeah it's a good Saturday's work and I suppose what what would you see as a good season for our growth this season are your hopes to to get into the playoffs this season I think being the only part time team in that league is a the first aim is to stay up, you know. Mm. I think what Gather has done is build a squad which can progress each year since got up the championship. And I think he's doing that. Uh, I think our pro fans are saying it's obviously a golden year for the club, probably most successful in their history. Uh, mm-hmm. We're up there competing on merit, you know. We're not just up there to make up numbers and stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't quite get the credit it would deserve at times, which yeah. is something that's not a bad thing because then you get March, you know, I think maybe if people want to take us lightly on a Saturday, happy days for us, you know, but yeah. I think we're a top team. When we're at it, I think we're a really, really good team. Mm-hmm. Long may it continue, you know, but it's a hard, the championship is one of these leagues where if you turn up Saturday, play well, you've got a good chance of three points and if you're not at it, you could get hammered because mm-hmm. then they can beat, you know, yeah. as you've seen us look results maybe already. Mm-hmm. Top, top, top really gonna, that's what happens in this league. So, no, the championship's a good standard as well so we just need to keep week by week and see where it takes us coming this season but we want to just don't rink, like, linger about a bobbing you want to have some ambitions so as a player I would love to make a player with our growth and, and anything can happen after that you know but mm-hmm. it's a long so yeah it's a long season anything can happen and do you think as well like home advantage for a team like our growth comes into it you know you speak about certain teams have benefit from home advantage our growth is probably one of the coldest grounds to watch um, to, to watch football in Scotland that the wind come in off the North Sea do you feel that as a player? Thankfully I've not had that yet I was <laughs> having joined on loan towards the end of last season and it was lovely mm-hmm. and then so far decent so up and saying them well there's this wind but obviously I played the reserve games there for Aberdeen stuff yeah. and played for the Aberdeen first team so I heard I've seen how bad it can be sorry and I've not really put up with our growth yet, but mm-hmm. hey boys, listen, if you're a team who want to pass the ball, be all nice and fancy and stuff, if you're coming to our growth in December, January in the winter, and want to play and we're smashing into your tackles and stuff down your face, it's not a good thing, you know, so mm-hmm. I think it's got such a good uh, home home history, you know, the last couple of years. Home no, been a bit- definitely. And you said you, um, you know, you played there for the, like, Aberdeen Reserves, the, as I said, we're recording this at the start of the international break. Unfortunately, you don't get the weekend off um, coming up. You're taking on what is the Aberdeen, it's class as Aberdeen under 21 side, but I think it's more 16, 17 year olds managed by um, your former teammate, Barry Robson. And it's the Challenge Cup or whatever they've renamed it for this season. Are you looking forward to that game and, and meeting up with Barry as well? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, going back to old stomping ground, it'll be good. It'll be good to see a few old faces. It'll be good to see Barry. I've seen him scouting us, uh, Patrick Fiscal, when I was doing my warm up. I'm sure I've seen him uh, stands last week. So, it would be pen ready to go. But no, it'll be good to see him. No, it'll be good. And it'll be, I suppose, for, for a team like our growth, how does like a championship team view that cup competition? Is it a, a serious competition for you guys in terms of winning silverware? To be fair, we've not really spoke about it. Uh, but we obviously go to training and stuff, and we'll mm-hmm. start next game, so you don't want to look ahead of yourself. But I'm sure the guy for what to do well in this competition. Obviously, we're doing well when we're winning a few games in a row. So I don't know how there's lots of good players on our, line, on our bench, like Bobby Lang and stuff, mm-hmm. Gavin uh, Dale Wilson and stuff. We've got really, ah, bro, the best thing I think about us is what. Uh, team spirit and stuff we're a very close knit group you know so I don't know if Gaffer want to give a few boys minutes or they want to keep the same team that's winning just now uh, but you'll it, give full respect to Aberdeen you know because obviously as you said it's an under 21 uh, playing against us mm-hmm. No definitely it's um, it'll be an interesting one to see how that develops um, over the, the course of the weekend but I'm sure obviously you'll be giving it all to, to get the right result for our growth even though you might still have a soft spot for Aberdeen. Do you still do you still look out for our results from yeah. now? Every week I still do. I, I love the club because I was there, I think, since I was about eight until early twenties. So you spend that lot of time at a club, you know. I lived in a city for ages. I still I, I love a club. Obviously, at the start you don't when I'm obviously a young boy, you don't know much about a club and 
you read into the history, buy your new and stuff. So no, I've I love my time and I'm treated well up there. So when I was up there, so no, I always have a place in my heart and I always check every week and I watch all the games when I can. You know, I watched uh, European games there as well mm-hmm. on the Red TV. So no, I've always watched out for results. No, it's uh, great to hear. And, you know, Nicky, it's been a pleasure chatting to you today and for you to give up your an hour of your afternoon to, to join us on Red Tinted Glasses. Thank you very much for your time. No problem. Uh, thanks. I've enjoyed it and all the best to you for the rest of the season. Yeah, and all the best to you and our growth and hopefully you continue to stay fit and um, things go well, our growth. Spot on. Top man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to that episode of Red Tin and Glasses with Nikki Lowe. I hope you all enjoyed the chat. And of course, if you did, remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more content. And if you did enjoy that chat and want to hear more of our interviews with former players, scroll back through the archives to hear chats with Richie Byrne, Jamie Smith, Steve Tosh, Cammy Smith, and Arold Stavrum and of course our most popular player interview to date was of course Jack Grimmer as well so if you want to hear any of those feel free to to search them up and until next time thanks for listening